Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased here to be joined with Loren Moray, environmental scientist, and we're going to have a far-reaching conversation on a wide variety of mind-blowing topics. I am Daryl Hamamoto, professor at UC Davis, Department of Asian American Studies. Loren, it's really great to be with you here today. Thank you very much, Daryl. Why don't you lead in on some of the fascinating research that you've been doing? Well, um, I'm a UC Davis grad. I um, graduated in 1968, one of the first women in the geology department. And uh, I came back in the 90s to do my PhD in the ancient history of the Earth's magnetic field, going back 25 million years. And um, then I met a very interesting man in Livermore when I was living there. Uh, I became a Livermore lab uh, whistleblower, nuclear weapons lab, and uh, his name was Marion Falk, and he started teaching me about radiation. And so I became an international specialist on radiation, and finally, one day, Daryl, I said, this global pollution with radiation that's killing the whole biosphere is omnicide. It's mm -hmm. suicide, uh, homicide, um, e ecocide is every kind of death, but basically it's a death across the whole earth of all living things. And finally I said, this just cannot be an accident. And I sat down at my computer in about the year, in about about six years ago, and I googled University of California plus weapons of mass destruction. So we're talking about 2010. Yes. Roughly. I'm sorry, it was University of California plus Skull and Bones. Plus Skull and Bones, oh yes. Yes. The Russell Trust. Yes, and that took me down a rabbit hole. I'm still going down because now I'm investigating who's at the very top, who really rules the world, and I discovered it's a, um, a very, very interesting history of ancient Iranian tribes, the original Zoroastrians, and the first world Persian Empire that uh, has controlled the world for the last 5,000 years. And so that brings us to UC Davis and what is occurring now with what was a covert presence of the Jesuits who, in Monsanto, because it's an agricultural college, um, and Monsanto was started by the Jesuits. And um, um, and this this uh, this global transition, one thousand year a millennium transition, from the decline of the original Silk Road, that created tremendous wealth for five thousand years, and the collapse now a thousand years later of the Western economy, and the rebirth of the Silk Road. Uh, which has been engineered by China, and now China and uh, Russia are partners, and Iran now has joined them. Now, the reason why I'm involved in this project is because many of the uh, audience members know that, well, it's May 7th, 2016, and uh, many of the people who are watching this uh, presentation are aware that the current Chancellor of UC Davis, Linda P. B. Katehi, was recently put on administrative leave by President mm -hmm. of the University of California System, Janet Napolitano. Right. And Ms. Moray here today is going to be bringing together this incredible research she's done in the area of ancient history in reference to the ancient Iranian bloodlines and connect it to what's going on right here and now at the University of California, Davis. And this shows you the importance of this deep humanities civilizational study that's purpose, purposely been excluded from the curriculum so that we have generations of 
of supposedly educated people who are unable to, to do any type of analytical work that's going to ins help ensure our survival, our planet's survival, land, sea, and air, and the animal species, including ourselves. That's just so we're gonna correct. We're gonna drill down in that area, mm -hmm. please. And um, I really want to thank you for um, the support that you've given me, and encouragement, and the recognition that uh, this is an important part of research. Uh, the ancient history that that practically no one knows about and um, I used to read a lot read books and read history and and believe all of that but I just got more and more confused and finally around that time that um, I was going down the rabbit hole I said wait a minute Confucius said signs and symbols rule the world not words and laws. And when I let go of that and I began trusting myself and my intuition and my experience and my insights, um, it changed everything. And I began looking at signs and symbols and that's what opened all the doors. It's all right in front of us. It's, it's there for everyone to see, but they don't know how to integrate, to relate, to put together the information to tell the real story. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you that this um, the synthesis, this grand synthesis that you've managed to pull together, it's not being taught in the contemporary university. No. This, what we are about to present to you, ladies and gentlemen, is a paradigm buster. And the academic establishment are going to have to come in this direction and acknowledge the incredible contribution that Lorraine Murray has made. Now, she's done it with a lot of open source material, a lot mm -hmm. of published books. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that she tells you is, is thoroughly documented. This is, some of it's, uh, you know, hypothetical, but it's thoroughly documented. It's all part of the discussion. And I hope to contribute, chime in uh, periodically as you're laying it out oh, for us. You're the one who got me here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you're, you're giving me too much credit, but I'll take it. <laughs> uh, okay, do you want me to blame you? <laughs> yes, you can blame me. I think we're, we're all <laughs> culpable. <laughs> well, um, I appreciate... Cheerfully culpable. <laughs> I appreciate blaming you. Okay. So, um, in the 60s, when I was here at, at, at Davis, um, there were 7,500 students. It was primarily an agricultural school uh, for ag economics and, and pomology, uh, uh, viticulture, um, it was uh, uh, how to grow fruits and, and, and vegetables, and they had animal science, and it was over half foreign students. And um, I was in absolute heaven. <laughs> I loved it. It was a safe place to be. The classes were great. Um, it was uh, just, Davis has always been a very, very nice campus. And uh, today, uh, from spending time in the pig barn, I mean the real pig barn on the campus, and the dairy, and um, just going out in the vineyards, and it was just so wonderful. And um, I have come back now in the year 1916. We've driven around the campus today and looked at buildings and names on buildings. 2016. I mean 2016, <laughs> okay. yeah. We're doing some time slipping here. <laughs> right. Okay. And, um, well, it's because I'm so astounded. It was like being in I 1916. It, and it <laughs> is a new, brave new world, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm here, and, oh, and yeah. you're telling me, you're giving me this uh, paradisical image of what UC Davis used to be like. And it's yeah. completely different. It's completely today. different. It's completely international. It's... Uh, very new world order. It's uh, part of the transhumanism uh, movement. It's um, the ancient bloodlines are here too. These ancient Iranian bloodlines. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> under the carpet. But I was able to lift the carpet, and um, it is Linda P. B. Katehi, who. Uh, when I started investigating her names and her origin and her associations and, and just her whole history, 
I went, oh my God, okay, now I understand what's happening. And just for your information, ladies and gentlemen, Linda P.B. Cote was just put on administrative leave and the, uh, I think the pretext for removing her was the fact that she had spent $170,000 of university money in order to uh, scrub her image on, on social media. And then there was some issue, for those of you who don't know, there was some issue about her being serving on boards mm -hmm. uh, and receiving uh, cash payment for that. But Lorraine is going to be drilling much deeper than that. This is, this is the official reason why she's temporarily being put out of the picture, but it goes much deeper than that. So I thought I would mm -hmm. provide a little bit of context mm -hmm. there. Please. Thank you. So um, Linda Cotehi was hired from the University of Illinois in 2009 as Chancellor of UC Davis, the sixth Chancellor of UC Davis. And um, I was here when Merak Hall was built. Um, it was the end of my undergraduate years here. And um, I knew Chancellor Emil Merak very, very well. And in fact, I was Arbor Day Chairman for several years and I planted the Merak Grove around Merak Hall in his honor, named the grove for him, and um, he was really a lovely man. I believe he was born in Vienna, Austria, and um, he was a wonderful chancellor. Uh, students always had priority over uh, other adults in his office. He would walk out of meetings with uh, Congress members, with faculty members, whatever, uh, to talk to a student, um, and that was the students were the priority. That's changed now. Um, she um, was actually came from Greece, and uh, she came through Chicago, which means you're a very, very special person. Many people like John Kerry's parents, came from Czechoslovakia through Chicago. Chicago is Rockefeller headquarters. And that's why they, they come specially. They're picked in other countries. They're selected and funded and, uh, and brought here. And they immediately have good jobs and positions and um, usually part of the intelligence uh, operation of the United States. So um, she came with her husband uh, to, from the University of Illinois. And the University of Illinois is very interesting. She's an electrical engineer, a specialist in, te in antennas. And her husband, um, uh, Spiros, uh, let's see, it's Seragunas, Seragunas. Mm -hmm. Um, is a uh, chemical engineer in uh, the uh, engineering department on the campus. And it's interesting that they're both involved in very, very new world order technologies. And she's involved in the antennas. Um, she has 19 antenna patents before she came to UC Davis. And they are all involved with the cell phones with switching, with integrating with smart meters and other uh, techno technologies. And, um, and her husband's involved in coatings and protective coatings on metals and materials. It's sort of material science. And this is extremely important now because the huge amounts of nuclear pollution created by Chernobyl, by nuclear power plants, by our nuclear wars with depleted uranium and, and um, battlefield nukes and Fukushima. And um, uh, the neutron bombs that they're using on the battlefield now, um, and then Fukushima on top of all of that. And there have also been several Chernobyl level events in the Ukraine with nuclear power plants and MOX fuel, which is what caused the Fukushima disaster. And those have all been in the last year. And no one even knows about it. Mm -hmm. 
So what that's done is the Wigner effect. The radiation attacks the surface of metals and materials, and it disintegrates uh, those materials. It steals electrons, and, and I don't know if you've ever, ever seen uh, if you put um, iron filings on a magnet and they start growing up, well, that's what all this radiation is doing to the surface of airplanes, to uh, thin metal like the, um, the bands that go around and hold hoses on metal nipples, for instance, in hydraulic systems on planes. And we are having a complete breakdown of the entire airline industry from entropy. The, um, the Wigner effect is basically the, the crumbling or the decay of materials. And um, uh, we're having uh, airplane crashes, we're having emergency landings all over the United States, and as the radiation increases and the exposure increases, it accelerates it. So here is uh, Chancellor Patehi's husband working in a very, very critical area of research on how to code materials and protect them from this breakdown by radiation, by nuclear pollution, and it's, it's contaminated the entire air column. So who's behind that? Who's doing this insane poisoning of the entire planet? Well, it's the Jesuits. And the Jesuits are very, very prominent within the University of California because they came with the Spanish. Okay, at this juncture, let me uh, pose a question yes. for, the, uh, for the skeptics because it's very uh, common in, in this type of discussion here to single out group A, B, or C uh, as being the source of all the world's ills. Mm -hmm. and. There are books on it, one, uh, The Vatican Assassins. So one question that comes immediately to mind is, is that um, are we talking about one singular group? Are we talking about one group in many different guises, different manifestations? Or are we talking about competing groups, Jesuits being one mm -hmm. of many? Could you please explain that before we well, move forward? Uh, basically, when you look into literature, for mm -hmm. instance, in the 1600s in uh, Czechoslovakia, there was a, um, I believe he was a priest named Komenus, and he wrote a, a book um, about, it was sort of um, an epic tale, I guess, and um, he described in that people sitting around together trying to come up with a global poison that mm. would kill many, many people close by and far away. And they were talking about genocide. And if you go back some more into um, the Bible, uh, you will also find mention of a global genocide. And you will also um, be... Um, be shocked at the recommendation to uh, to good Christians to go or Jews too to go into regions and to kill all of the people and to burn all of their buildings to and, salt the earth and salt the earth mm -hmm. and destroy all their their destroy the firstborn sons all their idols mm -hmm. yes and uh, so this is basically. Um, the Jesuit embrace, enfold, extinguish. It's the secret history of the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. And the interests behind the Jesuits, the entities that created the Jesuits during the um, Renaissance in Italy, uh, it was none other than Alessandro Farnese a Persian. From ancient Persia, his family came through Cappadocia in eastern Turkey, eventually to Italy, and they founded the first ten Etruscan cities in Italy. And when those were razed, 
they destroyed them, and they created the Roman Empire. The Romans, the Etruscans, the Holy Roman, em Roman Empire, they're all Iranians, they're all Persians, it's all Persian blood. Italians are Iranians. Their practices, their beliefs, their, uh, their uh, food, uh, their clothing attire. The Pope, for instance, wears a uh, papal tiara dome, uh, the, the papal dome, which is uh, uh, called the papal tiara. Well, that's what um, men in charge of tribes in Central Asia wear. They wear those very large domed hats. And um, uh, some of the women do also if they're a, a leader of the, of the community. And then the red slippers that the Pope wears, those are those are Central Asian slippers. You see them in mm -hmm. India a lot and in, in Asia. Um, so there are many, many uh, cultural ties um, and um, oh, legends and, and uh, religious practices that indicate over and over and over again that the Italians are really Iranians. Mm -hmm. And uh, Romania was named for the Roman soldiers, the Iranians, um, equestrian nomadic uh, uh, fighters, warriors, were brought to Romania, to Eastern Europe, and they were the soldiers, the Roman soldiers for the Roman Empire. So you see, uh, you see this fingerprint of Iranian DNA everywhere. And 14,000 years ago, um, DNA studies of a particular Iranian tribe indicate there was a mutation in the DNA and it caused uh, uh, different extremes of albinoism. So the most extreme expression is red hair and blue eyes, light blue eyes. And then uh, more uh, moderate expressions are blonde hair, green eyes, hazel eyes, gray eyes. You see a lot, a lot of Afghanis with gray eyes. And so now you can walk around the Davis campus or get on a train or uh, walk by some friends sitting on, a, on a, the, the steps of a, a building and you can start talking to them and you can tell they have Iranian blood. But it has to be from uh, both parents. It's a recessive gene. So that really got me started. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, now it's my understanding that that uh, Aryan came from Iranian. That's the, that's the right. synonym. So that's right. it has migrated down into our most recent history, world, the history of World War II. Yes. Global depression. Yes. So what I'm hearing from you is that this extensive history that goes back uh, millennia, right? Yeah, thousands of years. Thousands of years. Yes. We're witnessing the, I don't know if it's the end game or not, but we're, we're, we're witnessing the contemporary expression of this bloodline in 2016. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I don't know where you're going with this, but perhaps Linda Cote, what, where does someone like her fit into this grand scheme? Well, I had, to, I had to understand why she was brought to UC Davis. Why right. was she hired? We know about the antennas. Yes. And um, and then I discovered she and her husband were what, both working in in technologies that were very relevant to New World Order, the New World Order agenda. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. Then I um, started looking at her name and the origin mm -hmm. of the name. So her name is Linda, which is probably um, an American name that she took on when she came here. P. B. Katehi. And uh, Pisti is what the P stands for. Her first name is Pisti, her real name. And that's a Hungarian name for crowned or victorious. And that name was given to royal babies only. She's royalty. She's royalty. She's of a royal bloodline. Yes. And the Hungarians are from Central Asia. Uh, the early Greek, uh, that, that word, pisti, in early Greek is Stefano, Stephen. So that's what it means in all the languages of Europe and ancient languages of Europe. But that's not her name. It's pisti, which is Hungarian. The Hungarians came from Central Asia. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, that that was a, a first name probably in her family, but it's a man's name, hmm. which indicates even more that it was an important family name. Even though she was a girl, she may have been the firstborn, and they gave that name to her. That's what happened to me. Loren is a man's name. Hmm. Um, and then Pistis appears in Gnostic texts, which are related to Zoroastrian, the ancient Iranian uh, religion, in the 3rd to 4th century AD. And then uh, Pistici is um, in, in a, 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 a province of uh, Mentera in southern Italy, and it's the ancient name is Basilicata, Basilica. Mm -hmm. uh, the churches, sure, grand churches, sure. and so forth. Now, Pistici, the chi means the bloodline or the stock of the Pisti people or the sure. Pisti tribe. Mm -hmm. So there's the, her link there with Pisti to Basilicata, and her uh, second middle name is Basile which refers to Basilicata. Basile is a last name. Basilicata is um, in, um, it's in the southern part of Italy, as I said, and it refers to Basilica and, and these ancient, very, very grand churches. Now, it's really interesting that in the fourth century, there was a uh, Saint Basilos, Basilios, from that same name, who was the bishop of Caesarea, Roman Empire, and um, he was one of four men who started the Eastern Orthodox Church. So he was involved with Constantine and the um, the the whole uh, schism uh, between the Catholic Church and. Uh, the ones who did not want to submit, the Christians who didn't want to submit to the Pope. So you see she has a royal, religious, uh, high-level religious a background, and you would probably call her part of the Popal, Papal nobility. So um, so then, Kate, okay, what does Kate he mean? Well, I looked up Kate, it was only... There was only one reference to it, and it was to um, a, a, a town, a village in Uttar Pradesh, which is northern India, and it's where the ancient Iranians spilled over the Himalayas from Central Asia when their populations build up too much, and um, it's in the eastern part of the southern side of the Himalayas very, very old. All of these names and the roots of her names and all the associations go back uh, before the Christian period, before the Greeks even. So she is very ancient Iranian. Now, Kate, if you take the eye off, um, is a very rare rice that is grown on the Caspian Slope uh, in Gilan province to the, the west in uh, northern Iran. And it's actually where Stalin was born. Stalin was Iranian. Mm -hmm. He was not Russian. Or Georgian. Or he's Georgian. Off, he he was Iranian. Okay. And I have pictures of him when he was a young man. Sure. And um, so uh, the mother of Ataturk was also from mm. Gilan. Now this rice... Um, is the precursor or it's the arborio rice of the Italians that the Iranians took to Italy. Arborio rice mm -hmm. is an ancient rice the Iranians grew on the Caspian Sea. So um, that was uh, also Kate. There are villages in, in uh, Iran in Fars, Gazvin, Khorasan and Isfahan that are Kate and uh, that those are all very very old centers for uh, the Iranian culture. Mm -hmm. So there we have absolutely solid evidence sure. what her roots are. Now if I could boil it down, yes, we see that ostensibly 
Linda P. Linda mm -hmm. P. B. Katehi <laughs> was brought in because of her expertise in this antenna technology, mm -hmm. which I hope you'll talk about its mm -hmm. application. Yes. Currently. Yes. Uh, Nineteen unique patents credit to her, and then mm -hmm. there's her husband, who is a specialist in these uh, these coatings or material science. So that's the the exoteric reason why mm -hmm. they were brought in. Yes. Right? Right. But what I'm hearing is there's a much deeper metaphysical or esoteric yes. reason why she was brought here to UC Davis yes. and into the UC system. Yes. And this drama that's unfolding now, it might be a Punch and Judy show. That's what we're trying to figure out here. It might be just a dumb show for, for the public. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, if so, it's very dangerous. If, if it's, these, it's very dangerous. Yeah, if this hypothesis, yes. it's, it's a very strong one, I must admit. <laughs> Um, but as the evidence accumulates, it'll be much more compelling, probably elevated to the level of theory. Mm -hmm. But I think we're in a very dangerous position if we have such people like this who are helming a you know major institution. And I hope you will talk about her relationship to, because you mentioned her in passing, mm -hmm. uh, Janet Napolitano mm -hmm. and her background. Yes. Others of that, that, I guess they call them root races. Mm -hmm. These these royal lines that right. are controlling the destiny of humanity right. to the present, please. Well, some of the others who are on the main stage today, Janet Napolitano, she's from the province from Na where Naples is, right next to Basilicata. She's the University of California president, by the yes. way, ladies and gentlemen. Just yes. For your information, please go. On and please. she is from the province uh, of Calabria, which is right next to to the province Basilicata that, <laughs> that Chancellor Katehi came from. And uh, uh, Leon Panetta is another one. Leon Panetta, who was Minister, um, I'm sorry, Secretary of Transportation under Clinton, then he was uh, head of the CIA under Obama for two years, and then he was moved to Secretary of Defense, and I said, Wow, that's really interesting. Uh, gee, what ties all of those together? It's drugs. Hmm. Ah, yeah, Clinton built the MENA Airport in uh, Arkansas to bring China white heroin. The Chinese were paying back the, um, the Rockefellers for the um, development funds they loaned China. And so he built the airport. It's a um, free trade zone. The U.S. government has no jurisdiction. The, um, the um, uh, Walmart trucks and the Tyson chicken truck trucks go into that airport. They pick up the heroin, and they are the distributors around the United States. Just as a footnote, ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Hopsicker has produced a DVD series, and he's written books on this, this very system. It may sound bizarre. Crazy. It's never really hit the uh, the general public's uh, attention, but but what Lorraine is saying here has been explored and exposed by any number of investigative journalists. If you care to uh, follow up on it, check out the work of Daniel Hopsicker. Yes, that's correct. And also, Dope Incorporated, uh, Britain's opium war against the U.S. Well, this is a lot more than the opium war against the U.S. This is part of this global dope. Um, economy that's five times greater than the legitimate economy of the of the of the world, and uh, so this um, uh, this this Minet, uh, Mina Airport and um, and Panetta's uh, time in the CIA. Of course, they run all the drugs, and then the Secretary of Defense. Well. The military is very involved in the drug racketeering, uh, so forth and so on. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. the Vietnam War was about. It was getting uh, opium from the from the Himalayan foothills because Turkey stopped growing opium poppies, mm -hmm. and so they had to find another source. And um, uh, it's amazing uh, because drugs are just flooding the United States now. And for the last uh, about eight years, six or eight years, I've been reading JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and I'd never seen um, articles about heroin addiction. 
Well, they're reporting it like in every other article now in JAMA and what states it's going into. And it seems to, heroin use seems to increase when we're having wars or military conflicts in other countries. And it's because the soldiers are self-medicating the depleted uranium weapons and the weaponry uh, residue that they're exposed to is making them so sick they're going on heroin to just ease the pain. Um, but now, in 2016, I'm getting a lot of feedback from students at Davis that uh, the Davis campus and off campus is flooded with heroin. See, I never would have known that. Yes. Yeah, that completely <laughs> bypassed. I thought maybe crystal methamphetamine you know, or crank, that I knew about. I know about marijuana and, you know, alcohol, but I didn't understand that heroin was, had, uh, had become so popular. I understand in the, in the Northeast, however, in states like Vermont. Yes. There's all these different overdoses with upper class, upper middle class, yes. professional, quote unquote, white people. That's one of the first places it started that I read about. In, in Vermont. Jama. Yes, in Vermont. in Vermont. So it's linked to this larger network of it's a network. dope incorporated. Yes. We're talking about a global network with one template carrying all of this out. Mm -hmm. And it's from, originates with those ancient Iranian bloodlines. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have 10 uh, bloodline families that sit on a, uh, a, a council. And they are the ones who advise the Jesuits. The Jesuits work for the Iranian bloodlines. And the Jesuits were created by uh, uh, um, Alessandro Farnese, who became Pope Paul III in mm -hmm. the Renaissance. And Fidel Castro is pure Iranian ancient bloodline, and he's directly descended from Pope Paul III. Okay, you're going to have to unpack that one for us here. <laughs> Fidel Castro? Fidel the, the idol of all the left yes. liberal progressives in, in, yes. in academia? Yes. The, the liberator yes. of, uh, you know, El Pueblo? Yes. That Fidel Castro? That Fidel Castro. The one who is actually one of the richest, most wealthy person in the world? He is from, Please. <laughs> he's from the papal nobility family. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's from the Dukes of Castro. And uh, Pope Paul III had three sons, and he gave each of them a dukedom. The Duke of Castro, the Duke of Piacenza, and which is a city in northern Italy. That's where Castro's father was born. And you've done the genealogies? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Just so the yes. know, ladies and gentlemen understand that and this is just not fantasy. This is And the third yeah. dukedom that... Pope Paul III gave to his sons was the Duke of Parma. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was really shocked and then I started looking at Spanish land grants in California. And there was a U.S. Supreme Court lawsuit in um, uh, the 1850s. And when the Span Spanish government turned over the, their Spanish colonies in North America to the United States government, uh, there was a treaty made, the Treaty of um, Guadalupe, Hidalgo. Uh, Guadalupe and Hidalgo. 1848. <coughs> yes, that's mm -hmm. right. And uh, the agreement between the two governments was that um, uh, land grant holders, Spanish land grant holders would be allowed to retain the land they were granted by the Spanish. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the, pro the land was turned over to the U.S. government, the state of Calif California immediately sued to counteract, to reverse that, that treaty, uh, because they wanted all the land. And um, in that, during that, um, that process, the U.S. Supreme Court ended up reviewing it and uh, they asked for all land grant um, uh, uh, people claiming they had Spanish land grants. Title search. Title search uh -huh. to submit their claims. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court uh, 
looked at each case and ruled whether it was a valid claim or not. And so out of 850 claims that were made approximately, they awarded or they upheld 670. And then I started looking at the names of the, the um, grantees and I was shocked because the, uh, the greatest number and the largest amount of land was granted to people with the last name Castro. Ah. And <laughs> then I noticed what counties and what towns, because that's listed too, the modern towns, modern cities, and um, almost all of the UC, <laughs> almost all of the University of California campuses are <laughs> where Castro Lane grants are. It's and, beginning to come into focus now. And the Livermore <laughs> Nuclear Weapons Lab, mm -hmm. uh, Livermore is a Spanish land grant to the Castros also. Okay. So then I said, oh God, there's really a connection. And then I looked at UC Davis and I said, my God, they submitted a bid to have uh, the CERN uh, most advanced collider built here at UC Davis. And it is You're talking about the Large Hadron The Large collider. Hadron Collider. Okay. Yes, and Japan bid on it, Davis bid on it, or California did, mm -hmm. and um, somehow it ended up uh, half in Switzerland and half in France. And I, I asked uh, Laurence, why did they do that? He said, well, then neither France nor Switzerland own it, someone else controls it. Mm -hmm. And so that would be the, um, the vested, these uh, vested interests I'm talking about. And actually, it's those hidden bloodlines that funded the development of HARP and the Collider from okay. the very beginning. Let's go back to uh, yes. Lawrence Livermore. Okay. Because it seems to be the institution that was uh, at the dawn of this this right. uh, self-destructive hostage, high-level techno hostage taking right. situation, this extortion scheme that you're going to hopefully right. outline first. Right. And perhaps you can talk about your own experience uh, at Lawrence Livermore. Yes. You worked there for, for a time. Yes. Yeah. I uh, worked at Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab from 1989 to 91. And um, I worked on the WIP Project Waste Isolation Pilot Program in New Mexico, which was to bury nuclear waste underground. Mm. And um, uh, all attempts to make uh, a storage facility for nuclear waste have failed in the United States, all of them. And when the New Mexico one failed, they um, just said, we're going to do it in, in Nevada. It's the last place we can do it at the Nevada test site where they've done 1,300 nuclear bomb tests. And even that has failed because they put it in an active volcanic zone. So 32 earthquakes a month happen where they're planning to store nuclear waste safely for 250,000 years. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And um, so this, um, this, this is so crazy. It's very, very crazy. Um, but... Let's see, what was I talking about? We're talking about your, your background at Livermore, because what, oh, I'm, yes, what yes, I'm trying yes, to yes. establish is that yes. you've done this external research, but you you also have lived this. I mean, you, yes. you've worked in these institutions, yes. and so you're also bringing uh, the insights of someone who was working in the belly of yes. the beast. So in 1991, I, um, I packed all my stuff in my car one day, and I drove out the gate of the Livermore lab, and I left my keys and my pager in the, the guardhouse, and I went home. I fired them. Mm -hmm. They didn't fire me. And with the University of California, they've gone into chancellors and vice chancellors' offices and marched them, the guards, to the, um, the, the, the border of the, the campus and said, get out of here, you're fired and they were never allowed to remove their personal items. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I'm not going to let them do that to me. I'm leaving this place, and I'm taking all my stuff, and I'm going to fire them. 
and they've never stopped retaliating against me since then. That mm -hmm. was 1989, but 91. But I'm glad that I've had this experience. It's been hell in a lot of ways, but you have to be in their house. You have to live in their house to know who they are and what they are, and so that when you leave, you know how to challenge them. You know how to expose them because what they're doing is immoral, it's illegal, it's uh, insane. They are destroying this planet without our permission, without informing us, and without even having a good reason for doing it. They're just doing it because they can. Hmm. And um, I think that's what really uh, woke me up and um, just changed my whole life was taking this on. Okay. Well, I appreciate the um, the biographical element because uh, I, mm -hmm. I sense there there's something that's driving you that goes deeper than pure intellectual curiosity. Oh, no, it's because I love people. It's yes. because I love <laughs> nature. Yeah. I love living things. Yeah. We live in a beautiful world. It's the earth is so beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, th this is not a game. This is not an academic no. exercise, neither for Loren or for myself. No. I am in their house. I am working in the belly of the beast. I have suffered, and I'm not going to talk about it too much today, uh, the repercussions of asking certain questions about my own workplace, which is yes. I'm entitled to do as a citizen, as a sovereign human being, as, a, as an academic, as, a, as an American. I'm, a, I'm entitled to do that, and I will exercise those rights uh, to the best of my ability. But it takes research such as this, mm -hmm. cutting-edge research such as this, that will provide us the intellectual, the historical, the analytical framework to understand what we are facing. Because so far, these people have been very good in veiling the truth mm. and hiding it because mm -hmm. the Rockefellers own the University of Chicago. The, the Russell Trust runs Yale University. Mm -hmm. All these uh, bloodlines control information, scholarship, and every single aspect, and sciences, of course, almost every single aspect of our lives that uh, shape our world. And what I learned at UC Berkeley, um, I was working on uh, gender equity issues and minority equality and things like that uh, in the early 90s. And, and there were 500 lawsuits against the University of California for gender discrimination and, um, and also um, uh, ethnic, ethnic issues also. And, um, and so I learned, I started investigating, well, what is the University of California? Why are they breaking all these laws and everything? Well, it turns out that Dwight and Gilman started the land grant, the U.S. land grant program, and that was to have the U.S. government allot land in each state to build a state university. This is the Muriel Act, yes, correct? Yes, that's yes. correct. Uh -huh. And it was to educate the farmers, the pioneers, to create teachers and um, and military and and farmers to educate them more and it was to create a bigger economy it was to create wealth new wealth in the united states it was to benefit everyone not just the the businessmen and the oligarchs but also the people and uh so dwight and gilman uh they had everything to do with setting up uh, UC Berkeley, which was the first Berkeley campus. So they were very intimately involved with the University of California. And then they went on to um, establish the other state universities and colleges. But from the very beginning, all of these institutions were exempt from state laws. This is what I found out. Yes. They are a government within a government. That's right. A sovereign entity. And they actually were set up to benefit the, um, the oligarchs and industrialists and so forth who went to the Ivy League colleges. Sure. So the state universities were set up to train workers for the ruling elite. Mm -hmm. 
And so you need to understand the history and the ancient history of issues that you're involved with before you can ever really understand what is really happening. And as a footnote, President Gilman, who was the first president to really put his stamp on the, the University of California system, was a member of the Order of Death. He was yes. a Skull and Bones person. They were both Skull and Bones. They were both Skull and Bones yes. people. And uh, perhaps we can range in this, into this uh, area a little bit later because there's, a, there's an occult overlay when Absolutely. we're talking about this. Absolutely. Very, very much so. And the origin of Skull and Bones was in uh, Europe and Germany. Sure. 1822. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, um, it all, it all, it, you can't, it, it all sounds uh, bizarre and everything until you begin putting all of these pieces together, and then you find more and more evidence, and pretty soon you have an airtight case using government data. Sure. <laughs> and published books by... Yes. Quote unquote reputable scholars. Right. Who are always just slightly unable to complete the picture. Right. Purposely. Right. Because the academic profession does not allow you to fully bring all these different uh, elements of knowledge and information together. Right. In a comprehensive whole that really gives away the game. Right. This is what, why what we're doing today here is yes. uh, so exciting to me. So let's go back and look at the history. Please. Uh, so um, uh, Chancellor Katehi was hired from the University of Illinois, which is a military-based university. It's where the first computer and computer language was made for the Navy. The Navy is there. It's their research lab, their university. And ENIAC uh, was the first computer and it had a, a language, and then later on Fortran came out of the University of Illinois also. But that's where Katehi and her husband landed, mm -hmm. and there she ended up, um, her grad students of, students of course did the research, but she ended up with 19 antenna patents. And these antennas now, um, waveforms, are the new mechanism to enslave society, to take over the whole entire world. That's what HARP is. There are HARP bases all over Antarctica, and that's in training the Earth's magnetic field. And the animal studies for mind control were done here and are still being done here on the UC Davis campus. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the 60s, the students would come back from that secret facility and they were students who did work study. So they worked in, in the monkey colony, and they said that the monkeys have the top of their heads cut off and their wires coming out of them, and they can transmit waveforms uh, to them and make them uh, just climb up and down in their cage all day long. They can mm -hmm. command them to do anything they want to. And um, it sounded so out there that I didn't pay very much attention to it. But now I understand as I see this all unfolding and other experiences I had. Speaking of the literature, ladies and gentlemen, you might want to check out a book by Dr. Jose Delgado yes. called Toward a Psycho-Civilized Society. Yes. And you have photographs in there with the, yes. the monkeys, the simians, yes. with part of their skulls. Uh, removed and and I I think the technology was called the stem sievers. Yes. So this is decades old technology. Yes. Who knows what they're doing now? But you're saying that the antenna antenna technology that Linda that quote unquote Linda, PB Katehi yes. uh, is responsible for is integral to this new phase in mind control, the behavioral control. It's the delivery system. The delivery system. Okay. Yes. Please go ahead. And Delgado also wrote a book, uh, the biology of aggression. And so they can use these frequencies to cause food riots. They can use these frequencies, as in, as in Rwanda, that big, huge massacre in Rwanda. Those were Russian, Ukrainian oligarchs who sent thugs down to Rwanda. The whole place had been wired up with antennas. These guys had been hooked up to computers, and they were programmed before they went down to Rwanda to carry out the slaughter, and it was plain and simply so that the Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs could steal all the wealth of the colonists. 
Mm -hmm. And the order was to slaughter all of them, every single white person, mm -hmm. and steal all of their wealth, go into the banks, strip their bank accounts, strip, uh, take all their securities uh, from safety deposit boxes. And the, uh, the Africans there um, had no money, so they were used to cover the slaughter of the sure. white people. Mm -hmm. And now, closer mm -hmm. to home, this is speculative, of course, did you see something similar taking place recently down in Burlingame, California, when the social justice warriors started rioting and oh. acting up? Could you? Is, I is didn't that, know about that. Oh, yes, yes, overturning uh -huh. police cars, uh -huh. vandalizing them, beating up uh, supporters of party A, B, or C. This is when Donald Trump came into town. This oh, I earlier remember this that. Week. Yes. Yeah. But what you're describing yes. there uh, was caught on camera by... Yes people uh, such as uh, yes. InfoWars news yes. gatherers. Yes. And it's been seen by millions of people all over the world. Yes, that's so ladies and gentlemen, if you want to see a real yes. live, because Rwanda might be removed in time and distance from us, but if you want to see this type of control being rolled out here and now, right in, your, in our area, in the United States of America, take a look at that YouTube footage and break it down. I suspect that, they, that the antenna arrays were out there. Absolutely, they're there. That? Absolutely, a hundred percent. All of the UC campuses now, the street corners have been taken up. They've put uh, um, surveillance and and other technology packages into the ground. They dug down five feet and then they cemented it in so that it can't be removed. And it's hooked up to the street lights, to the smart meters to cell phones. It's all integrated now. That's what Katehi's technology is about. It's about integrating all of that. So you get a huge array of antennas that are all integrated and you control everything. Hmm. So the HARP model has been regionalized or localized? It's been localized. It's been um, made more granular. Mm -hmm. It's more, it's more uh, powerful, but it's more miniaturized. Mm -hmm. It's uh, gotten smaller and smaller and more efficient and had a bigger and bigger impact. Okay. So it's a creeping, um, it's a creeping um, mechanism for controlling humanity. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been teaching here at UC Davis for 20 years now, and beginning about eight years ago, perhaps even 10 years ago, I began to see a 180 degree shift in the intelligence level, intellect, analytical mm -hmm. ability, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, expressive ability, intellectual yes. ability, of course, I mentioned. Yes. And in, in attending that, I also saw a gradual acceleration of hostility and yes. anger. Yes, yes. And much of this has been directed towards myself yes. and towards other faculty that's, people. That's right. And I'm reading that this is, ha, has been taking, taking place coast to coast, north to south at different universities. So where do the students, undergraduates, I'm at the university, mm -hmm. where do they fit into this picture? Are they being used as a shock troop for this transformation? Oh, absolutely. It's even Please worse elaborate. than that. Yeah. But let me tell you what it's like in the 60s. In okay. the 60s, when I was a student at UC Davis, I used to go home to Santa Barbara for holidays and summers, mm -hmm. and I noticed, or just uh, Easter break or something, and I noticed that when I was driving back on Highway 5, I'd start getting really depressed about coming back to Davis. Mm -hmm. Something, this horrible depression and overwhelming fear and, and um, un uneasiness came over me, and I just never could understand it. but. Um, it would always start about 150 miles from here. Mm. And so very recently I was reading about um, harp facilities in California. Well, there's a harp facility in Visalia mm -hmm. and it's to transmit Voice America to countries around the world. And there's always also a naval air base in Visalia, a mm -hmm. U.S. Navy air base. So that transmission was coming out of that harp facility in Visalia. I see. And that was a long time ago. That was in the 60s. But recently, a woman in Texas, I was telling her about that. She said, my friend has a son who's at Davis now, and he's complaining about the same thing. Hmm. And there's also a very, very large antenna on the south side of the freeway 
um, on your way from Davis into Sacramento. There's a huge antenna out in the middle of a field that's also a Navy antenna. Uh-huh. And that's integrated with the HARP technology and with antennas up in Oregon. Mm. So they've been doing this since the 50s. My gosh. So these and are like carrier waves that are affecting these are, behavior. Yes. These are ELF, extra long frequency, or ULF, ultra long frequency carrier waves and they put the applications on that carrier wave. So right now they're transmitting suicide um, um, frequencies that make people cause, uh, create, uh, commit suicide. And this is all over the Davis campus. Mm -hmm. It's all over California. There's signs and billboards all over San Francisco, right on the main Market Street. They're huge, 10 foot high, um, a displays along the sidewalk right next to the curb and their posters with hotlines for suicide hotlines if you feel like committing suicide call the hotline and they have it on the other side also so the pedestrians walking down the sidewalk can see it mm -hmm. and um, uh, they uh, the, my Native American friends have said oh, the young people are committing suicide five four and five a night on the reservations mm -hmm. and the reservations have the Indian reservations in the United States they have the mineral rights to them they were put on the poorest land but they have 85 percent of the energy sources the uranium the coal uh, whatever that creates energy um, the oil and gas and they had the misfortune of um, of uh, being given that great wealth and they've said to me many times why can't we just give them the mineral rights and have them leave us alone I said they don't work that way so these uh, technologies now what is so alarming about what's happening in the universities is that in the fall of 2015 less than a year ago mm -hmm. the state university cap uh, campuses were turned over to Satanism. Okay, let's stop at this juncture. <laughs> How do we substantiate that? How, where do we look in order to verify that claim? Well... All right, because we're, we're doing solid right. scholarship here. And this this has to do with uh, Katehi also. Okay, the, that um, doesn't surprise me. Okay, uh, just a minute. Oh, so where, in the fall, the of, we had a rollout of, yes. of the Satanic agenda. Yes. Yes. All right. So I started seeing satanic sam uh, symbols on and off UC Berkeley, the UC Berkeley campus. Mm -hmm. And for instance, I saw the um, the head of the goat, uh, which Baphomet. Yeah, Baphomet. Um, in the goat of Mendes. In students' windows, uh. I started seeing stars turned upside down, um, with so that the two two points of the stars represented the goat's horns. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw American flags turned upside down and backwards on the balconies of the students' apartments. That was representing overthrow of the U.S. government. Uh, Laurence and I have recorded uh, the ski team, UC Berkeley ski team, in the house next door to us during parties. Uh, they were drinking and dancing and everything and they were talking in loud voices about overthrowing the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. in no, no, this is anecdotal, though. This no, we have tape recordings. Well, you, you've, you've uh, recorded it, but you're interpreting it. So uh, or do you have any sort of doc? Because I've been reading in, in the uh, corporate press about the growing popularity of, of religions such as Wicca. So they're just portraying it as a form of religious expression rather than a satanic takeover. I think, you know, I agree with you. There's something deeper here. That, that oh, there's much more. Okay. Yes. So, but, but I want to, for the, for the sake of, of the skeptics out there, um, beyond the anecdotal, and I know you, you've recorded mm -hmm. and you've photographed these signs. I've seen them as well. YouTube mm -hmm. is full of, you know, there's a satanic uh, ritual taking place at the Super Bowl at the American Music Awards. The Internet's full of that, that type mm -hmm. of um, display. So we know something's going on. I wanted to find out definitively, is there some sort of Department of Defense or 
something like equivalent to the, the National Security Memorandum 200 that was workshopped, a white paper that says we are going to convert the, the universities and college in the United States to Satanism. It doesn't come out directly like that, but it's happening not just in California, just on the UC campuses. Mm -hmm. It's happening across the United States. It's happening in Europe. Um, for instance, uh, uh, in the UC campuses now, uh, in the, in the uh, land-grant university campuses around the U.S., there's very heavy recruiting with very young entering students, female students, to, um, to become prostitutes. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of student prostitution now which is encouraged uh, by these sort of underground networks and they're coming from the campus but in Europe they have referred to this coming out of the military and we know that when the US um, destroyed Yugoslavia Dynkarp went in and the first thing they did was to begin recruiting young women who were starving to death and, and you know uh, living in horrible conditions to be prostitutes mm -hmm. And I saw those beautiful Yugoslavian girls in uh, Tokyo, in Rapongo, which is the nightclub area of Tokyo. And they were obviously on drugs. They were standing in doorways in pairs, and they were, um, they were looking for customers. Mm -hmm. um, this is happening uh, at the University of Michigan. Um, they have a satanic group active uh, on and off the, the university campus. Well, at Harvard University, uh, some student organization they claim to be uh, satanic or luciferian was going to hold a black mass on campus. That's they, right. They did call it off. That's right. But they, I think they were testing the waters to see how far they could take this agenda. Well, off the campus is a satanic group, a formal group, I see. In, uh, Mich in, in where the University of Michigan is. Is mm -hmm. that Lansing? I'm not uh, sure what city it is. The University of Michigan? But they East were Lansing is Michigan State. Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor, yes. okay. okay. So <laughs> they, um, in the mainstream media, they reported a, an official satanic group, right. organized group, Mm -hmm. uh, was going down to Louisiana to do a satanic ritual for the city council. Right. And, um, and it was like there was a big question about whether the city council wanted them to do it or not, but it ended up happening, and now there's a new chapter of that satanic uh, group in Louisiana in that city. I think it was New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So... Um, this is coming out of the military. Okay. It's part of the occult. All right. So occult does this perhaps trace back to Colonel Michael Aquino? Oh, Are that, you familiar with that individual? Absolutely. It traces back to the, um, the, the Jesuits. It traces back to Mesopotamia, to the Kabbalah and the Talmud, which were uh, magic cult instruction books. Mm -hmm. And they recommended pedophilia in children, but they had to be under eight years old, mm -hmm. and it's in the Kabbalah and the and the the Talmud, and um, properly practicing Jews. I'm not including them. Mm -hmm. uh, they follow the uh, Torah. Mm -hmm. The Talmud and the Kabbalah are satanic. The Babylonian cults. Talmud. Is yes. That what it is? Yes. Okay. Those are satanic cults. And are those satanic? cults controlled or were they created by these ancient Iranian bloodlines? Yes, they were. Please they were expand. Uh, well, uh, for instance, uh, the Aldo Brandinis. Aldo Brandini is one of the ancient Iranian bloodlines. It's a famous Italian family. Mm -hmm. And uh, Aldo Al is the, Dob is devil, hmm. Dini. El Do the people of the of the devil. Yeah, the people of the devil. Wow. So they are they're definitely satanic. They're proud of it. They're open about it. Uh, we have um, a website, lorenmaray.info, and we have a Rothschild ball with photographs 
of the Rothschilds and their guests and, and members of their family um, uh, doing satanic practices. This is the mask ball photos? The mask ball. And by the way, they're called Venetian masks, aren't they? Yes, they are. Right. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes. So we can see the cultural and the yes. historical continuities, ladies and gentlemen. And, and the Venetians um, were Iranians. Well, yeah, you, you alluded to that. Yes. That's why I, I yes. interjected that, because yes. I'm, uh, I'm interested in masking. Because but the <laughs> Middle East, these Mesopotamians, all of Eurasia, we know now from DNA studies doing, done over the last five years, especially by Russia, okay. all of Eurasia was settled by Central Asians. Please talk a little bit about the DNA studies, and I, yes. I assume that these studies are coming out of the Human Genome Project, right? Is that, um, no, they wouldn't be coming out of the, the, okay. the Human G Genome Project, which is American. They're coming out of Russian okay. scientific research. All right, because yes. this DNA, f from our conversations, yes. this DNA research provides the scientific backing mm -hmm. that helps support this this uh, hypothesis or this theory in the making, um, it's irrefutable, it's ironclad, and I think this is probably the most uh, important uh, development in, in this type right. of research. It's, it's hard science, it's not fantasy. It's yes. supported right. by definitive DNA analysis, and yes. you can trace the distribution yes. of these different peoples, these different yes. tribal groups, and, yes. and how their culture and their religious practices migrated yes. across the world and how they have been transmitted to us to, down here to 2016 are embodied right. in people like Linda right. P.B. Katehi. Right. Please. And so these ancient Iranian tribes um, moved into Europe and the Middle East. So the, um, the Basques are ancient Iranian bloodlines. From, Is there a DNA Yes, report? from the DNA. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the... Um, the Berbers in North Africa, in the Altai Mountains, they, the, the um, Basques, the Berbers, and the Kurds all came from the Hittites. And the there's Hitt DNA research yes, on that? Yes, this is okay. from DNA research and also language similarities. All right. And, uh, so blood this is a multidisciplinary effort. And blood but the types. thing is these disciplines are all compartmentalized. They're but compartmentalized. You've, you've ach you're achieving yes. a, a grand into, synthesis of into, all this. Yes, yes. synthesize it. Okay. I've distilled the information right. into a picture that makes sense. Okay. And it's all internally consistent as well. All right. So um, you take multi-factors, you start putting them together and relating them, um, and then you find more things. They, they introduce new things that you wouldn't have thought of. How could I ever think in a million time, million years, I knew that Arborio rice had to be from Iran. Mm -hmm. and, um, but how would I ever imagine that investigating Katehi's origins <laughs> would bring me to the source of Arborio rice in Iran? Or the Familia Castro. Yeah, or the Familia right, Castro. Right, the Farnese. Yeah. Right, and so, all the different linkages. So for instance, with Castro, <laughs> Uh, the, in, this is a different kind of a DNA study, but it's physical characteristics and how powerful they are. Um, I said, okay, Alejandro Farnese or Pope Paul III worked for a Borgia, and, um, who was the Pope. And when that Borgia died, um, Lucretia Borgia was his daughter, the infamous Lucretia Borgia. And so when uh, that Pope died, he made... Uh, Alessandro Farnese, a cardinal at 24, and then he made him Pope as his successor. And so I took photographs of paintings of Alessandro Farnese when he was young, and then when he was Pope, and then when he was a very old man as a Pope, in his 80s or something. And then I took paintings of his sons, and their coats of arms. The coats of arms are always on the paintings. And, um, and then I collected uh, Pope Paul III's grandsons, put photos of them. They were cardinals. And then I found a painting of Fidel Castro in black, a black, like a Spanish hat or a monk's hat, and uh, a black robe with just a tiny white collar, you know, peeking through. And I said, what's this? Well, it's his 
portrait which will have his coat of arms added to it after he dies. Mm -hmm. And then that will be put in some palace in uh, Italy. Okay. In Piacenza, one of their mm -hmm. palaces in Piacenza. <laughs> and then I said, okay, well, um, uh, oh, there, the, the way, well, what happened um, in the, um, the Hellenic period is that the Farnese's, one of them was uh, one of the generals, the, one of the eight generals who guarded Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great appointed him to be the governor. He was the, the, governor, the governor of ancient Egypt. And when Alexander the Great died, um, he made himself a pharaoh. And Alexander the Great had given his sister to this general to marry. So they became the pharaoh um, and the pharaoh's wife. And after that, uh, almost all the Farnese's have a middle name or first name of Alexander, Alejandro, or Alessandro. So Castro's name is Fidel Alejandro Castro. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you can trace them even before that back into Mesopotamia. So we've got the genealogy as you yes. read with uh, P.B. Katehi. Yes. We've got the DNA and you were talking about the physiological resemblance. The physiological. That you were doing. Please break that down. For so us. when I got all these pictures together, mm -hmm. and I had um, a photograph of uh, Fidel Castro when he was a teenager or something with no facial hair, mm -hmm. and so I got a painting of Philip the First of Spain, the first, um, uh, the first uh, Habsburg king of Spain, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, he had a certain kind of lips. They were very thick, and they, they were sort of had vertical lines in them or folds. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a mutation. It's a genetic mutation. It's actually a defect. Mm. And I compared it to Fidel Castro's lips. He mm -hmm. has Habsburg lips. Mm -hmm. It's indistinguishable. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, it's absolutely a bloodline. And then I did this to John Kerry. John Kerry's family were Jews in the Habsburg Empire in Czechoslovakia, and they were Huff, Huff and Judah, house Jews. So they were very, very high in the court, and they advised the kings. Teresa Heinz Kerry is from a Portuguese Huff and Judah family. Mm -hmm. And her family advised the Portuguese court. And uh, then I found a painting of John Kerry's ancestor on his mother's side. She was a Forbes, right. not of Malcolm the, Forbes. Of the opium family Forbes. The opium family. The Yale yes. Forbes. And I found <laughs> the first sea captain, Forbes sea captain, in 1823, this painting was painted, and um, it's in his uh, uh, house, which is now a museum in Boston. Those are the Boston Brahmins. They were the, the drug cap dealing captains. And, um, and I, I almost, I just couldn't believe it. Oh, my God. His, that ancestor, Captain Forbes, who had three of the fastest clipper ships when he was 24, he... John Kerry looks exactly like him. Hmm. So these are ancient bloodlines that they keep. They know how to breed, who to breed into the line, um, and how to keep the physical characteristics. How could someone 150 years later, 175 years later, how could he look exactly like, how could John Kerry look exactly like him? That's, that's like 10 generations or eight generations. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I realized they have very, very strict breeding, breeding uh, programs. And for instance, uh, with the royal families, the popes had to always give permission for two members of a royal family to marry. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, especially if they were on the throne. And there could be no 
uh, relatives or family association for seven generations or they in order to marry and when the uh, Roman empires collapsed the Western Empire collapsed first the Eastern Empire collapsed in um, the 1500s late 1400s um, the um, these ruling part families wanted to reassemble the Habsburg Empire remember the Roman Empire became the Habsburg Empire and they wanted to recreate that Roman Empire and they did it by intermarrying very closely related people but they had to all have land that were pieces of part of the Rome, Holy Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And so there, were, there was so much inbreeding in the Habsburgs, uh, the Jesuits did it actually. And um, they did it, um, I mean, one particular Habsburg prince who was to be the emperor, Holy Roman Empire, had so much inbreeding that recently Germany did DNA studies on the whole Habsburg, Habsburg bloodlines. And um, they said he had the DNA uh, of someone who had been the product of um, sex between uh, a sister and a brother. Hmm. That's Egyptian, isn't it? That's, that's a, Egyptian. That's a dynastic yes. Yes. pairing. Yes. So what you're saying also, uh, before we leave mm -hmm. this point or move on past it, is that certain physical traits are also passed on. Yes, that are they are. They, they're telltale yes. physical traits because of this breeding program, including yes. mouth structure, yes. in the case of Fidel, at the yes. brow, the bridge, uh, the, the nose yes. structure. Yes, intelligence, beauty. Uh, there are many, many characteristics that they're breeding for, but it can also be uh, a way to wage war. So instead of waging all these wars to reunite the Habsburg Empire, the war was in bed. Uh -huh. So they did it through inbreeding. And then they can uh, reintegrate the well, empire. Well, after about, consolidate it. after about 200 years, a bloodline will just die out because they're infertile from so much inbreeding. Mm -hmm. And so they would just take a cadet family, one of the other branches, and they'd plug them in. Mm -hmm. And so it was the same bloodline but if you look at the Habsburgs, they all have strawberry blonde hair. It's mm. reddish blonde. And um, there's a Pope, Orsini, who had reddish blonde hair. And I think he was involved in the, the Habsburg line. Okay. Well, that helps explain how, by examining portraiture and today photography, yes, and perhaps uh, some forensic scientists, yes can break it down as well, measure eye yes. distances and eye color, yes. and of course DNA. We're going to be um, plugging in some of the missing yes. pieces of this puzzle yes. here to further support this, this hypothesis yes. of this, this ancient bloodline that's at the head of, uh, of our yes. civiliz world civilization. Yes. And, so and, and mean us harm. They want to, yes. from what yes. I'm gathering, they want to exterminate most of the yes. human population, regardless of race. They, they do. They they have their they've had their own breeding program, especially through the universities. Mm -hmm. I had fifty three wedding, uh, I mean marriage proposals, at Davis and in the UC system, and I was going crazy. It was frightening me to death. I thought they were crazy. I didn't know why they were asking me to marry them. Mm -hmm. Well, they were uh, Kuhn Loeb, the Loeb Kuhn Loeb banking yes. family. Mm -hmm. They were. Um, uh, uh, there was another one, uh, a couple more. Anyway, they were all banking. Oh, um, Goldman Sachs. There was a Sachs in, introduced to me in the geology department at, at Davis in uh, Berkeley. And he said, you're really a catch. And, and I just, I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. Now I understand. These are breeding programs. And you were targeted yes. as a broodmare. Yes. That's yes. what how Diana Spencer yes. described herself. Yes. She was a broodmare. She was a broodmare yes. to help regenerate the, she was a brood the decadent mare. line of... She was a broodmare because her biological father was Sir Jimmy Goldsmith. Sure. And the Goldsmiths and the Rothschilds came from Frankfurt, Germany in the mid-1700s to establish banking in London. 
to take over sure. that banking center. Mm -hmm. And they intermarried. They are Iranians. They are not Jews. They're Iranians. And so that put the Iranian bloodline into the royal family of England. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find out. You see, um, uh, Kate Middleton's mother's maiden name was Goldsmith. Mm -hmm. So they have a hidden history, too. Sure. And, and there is a book, a fairly decent biography. It's called Billionaire, and it's about Sir James Goldsmith. Yes. And it will tell you about his marriages, his affairs, yes. his dalliances. Yes. Uh, what, this might be slightly off topic, though, but it seems like bastardy is really important to understanding this. We're, oh, they, yes. They breed outside of these family oh, authorized yes. lines. But yes. how do these bastards, in this strict term, yes. how do they figure into this ruling system? Well, one of them is, uh, one of those bastards is uh, Hitler. He was a Rothschild. Rothschild. Sure. An I, another, I thought that was just an apocryphal. No. no it's, another okay. one is Bill Clinton's mother, who was the illegitimate child of Winthrop Rock, sure. Rockefeller, who was governor of Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas. That's why Clinton is uh, was president, and now Hillary Clinton. She's actually, her middle name was Rodham. What I, I looked it up, and it was shortened from Rodonsky, and she's from a Jewish family in Rodonsky, Poland. Mm -hmm. And um, wasn't that her stepfather, or her natural, her no, biological father? Rodonsky was her natural her father. Okay. Yeah, because she also had a stepfather who was Jewish. I uh -huh. think. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's okay. She's Eastern European. So, so they were bred. They were bred. They were. That set was up. a breeding. Okay. Yes, that was a breeding program. And just out of curiosity, because this is in the news lately, there's some uh, some talk that Chelsea Clinton was the offspring of Webster Hubble and. Hillary Clinton, who was Webster Hubble? I know. I don't know. I know he was an advisor to the Clinton family, oh. but she's a dead ringer for Webster he, Hubble. Oh well, then she's not the child of Bill Clinton. Nobody words. cares in those families; they just they just breed who they're told to breed to. So why was Bill Clinton um, sterile, or he was unable to breed? They didn't. With, with, they didn't want that bloodline. They wanted the other one. They wanted the Rod Radinsky one. Uh, but like, mm -mm. No, they wanted the Hubble. The, yeah, that's what I'm trying yeah. to figure I out. I don't know you who don't, he is. Okay, so. that's on the agenda for yeah. research. And we're deputizing, people yeah. are watching this, yeah. we are deputizing you as researchers because as you're finding out, it's not coming out of academia. <laughs> Most of the exciting research and the insights uh, are, uh, are, are, aren't are bound by these Another one is areas. the royal family of Monaco. Ah, and Grace Kelly. Yes. Uh, um, Prince Rainier was actually the son of a um, Algerian, I uh, know a Moroccan uh, housemaid. I didn't know that. And the Prince of Monaco, and he was sterile, so his wife had a baby with with um, no one exactly knows who. Mm -hmm. But you know how beautiful they are. Uh, Princess Caroline oh, and, yeah. and Princess uh, um, Stephanie. Stephanie and how gorgeous, very handsome Prince Rainier was. Uh, that's because his mother was half Moroccan. Mm -hmm. She was Berber. This is the ancient Iranian bloodline <laughs> bred back into her. Another one is... Where is, does the Kelly line come in? She's Irish-American um, and Catholic. Uh, she was more than that. She okay, was that's blonde, what I'm asking. And blonde and blue eyes. So right. she's Iranian. She's Iranian because that's that's, a, a, that's what you're referring to. Alluding yes. to it is a mutation. Yes. Yes. The blue eyed blonde yes. is a mutation. Yes. So this is again yes. how you can can yes. trace this this bloodline yes. through a physiological. Right. And she's yes. she's you know world class beauty. Yes, very beautiful. Down today, which yes. we're still yes admiring her movies with yes. you know Cary Grant. And, right. But you see, mm -hmm. she's Irish, and the Irish were Iranian. Please expand on that, because that's so counterintuitive. Well, the um, the uh, these uh, Iranians with mutations feel they felt more comfortable the blonde and the redheads. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't they don't have the right pigment. Uh, they Very fair normal. skinned. Yes, yeah. and uh, so they feel they felt more comfortable at in colder climates or at higher altitudes. Mm -hmm. So they migrated up into Scandinavia mm -hmm. and to uh, the British Isles. 
and uh, there are a lot of ginger men in Ireland. Well, that's Iranian blood, and uh -huh. it has to be, remember, it's a recessive gene, so it has to be from the male and the female. Is there a DNA study on this recessive gene and tracing Irish people, oh, quote-unquote, to yes. Iranians? Oh, yes, there's, okay. yes. I just wanted yes. to double-check. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> just so that and that's the viewers the, understand that yes. this is not just being pulled out of the hat here. And that's, This is science we're yes. talking about. This yeah. is science, science-based. It's mm -hmm. solid, and I really trust these recent uh, Russian DNA studies. They did them very carefully and they did them for a very specific purpose. I wanted to ask about that. Politically, why for are the Russians doing instance, this? Please. For instance, <laughs> there's all of this uproar in the Ukraine now because the Ukrainians are saying, we speak Ukrainian and the Russians, the pro-Russian people are speaking Russian and they're the Russian Orthodox, but we're Ukrainians, we speak Ukrainian. Well, it's the Vol Bolsheviks who made up a pidgin language and called it Ukrainian to set up a dynamic that divided the, the Ukrainian. Uh, they made a Hegelian dialectic mm -hmm. artificially. They're mm -hmm. all the same people. Mm -hmm. They came from Scandinavia into Kiev. They're called the Rus. Which is red. Rus, yes, yes uh -huh. red. Mm -hmm. And if you, we watched the Ukrainian war for uh, two years, and there would be all these soldiers, some were blonde, the Ukrainians, and a lot of them had dark hair. And then all of a sudden, a little video clip would come on from the battlefield for that day. Mm -hmm. And there would be a soldier standing there with ginger red flaming hair and you go, oh my God, where did he come from? Mm -hmm. And there were uh, Viking colonies all over the Ukraine on the rivers for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And in Turkey, there are redheads all over Turkey sure. also. All the way down through Rome, right? Yes. The Varangian Guard. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. And so all of these were ancient Iranians with that mutation who went into Scandinavia to a more comfortable, a colder climate. And then they came down through the Mediterranean on their ships and colonized the Mediterranean and Ukraine and Turkey and the mm. Crimea. Mm. So this marriage between Grace Kelly, Irish Catholic, Irish American, and Prince Rainier of Monaco was really a homecoming. A Iranian bloodline. It's a genetic homecoming. It's a yes. It was right. Iranian bloodline. And you had the power of the entire world focused on this. This was the biggest wedding until Princess Diana married Charles. This was That's like a, right. a world historical right. event. It was a fairy tale princess bride yes. type of scenario. Yes. All right. So you now, had all that energy focused on on the the consummation of these right. these lines that right. were coming back and together they, and fusing. They keep rebreeding the ancient stock, mm -hmm. the chi, the chi in Italian, yeah. like mm -hmm. um, Aldo, let's see, like um, um, Medici. Medici. Mm -hmm. Yeah, chi means the um, the stock, the mm -hmm. bloodline you're from, or mm -hmm. the tribe. Mm -hmm. It means DNA is what it means. Right. And it's always mm -hmm. through the female. It's not through the male. It's mm -hmm. through the female. And they also breed their animals through the female. That's the most important breeding. breeding uh, in the breeding pair, the female is the most important. And it's because um, the, the, um, the DNA and the RNA in the mitochondria uh, is, is separate from the DNA and RNA in the nucleus of the cell. And it's the mitochondria that provide all the energy for the body and body functions. So in the organs that use the most energy, the highest percentage of, of, uh, D, of uh, mitochondria are in those cells, and it's the brain cells and the heart cells. So when, when radiation passes through a cell, it can miss the nucleus, but it can't miss the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And so when it damages the DNA in the mitochondria and the RNA, then you have all of these brain diseases and heart diseases which have escalated. They've gone up exponentially since the nuclear age started with the dropping of the, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. Mm -hmm. 
Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, let's take a brief break so that we can refresh ourselves and then we'll restart for part two. Thank you, Lauren. This has been a great conversation. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to complete today's discussion with a analysis of Urban Shield and connect it to what, what is taking place here at the University of California, and more specifically, the University of California, Davis, with Linda, quote unquote, PB, Katehi, and all the other uh, characters in this crazy little drama of ours. So, Loren, could you yes. please give us an overview of Urban Shield? Yes. What is the implication there? So, um, Chancellor Katehi was hired in October of 2009. Mm -hmm. um, in March of 2011, Fukushima occurred. And in October of 2011, a military exercise with international troops uh, was uh, carried out in the San Francisco Bay Area um, on the UC Berkeley campus. And uh, this included uh, military personnel, the U.S., uh, Israel, and the uh, mostly the Aramco oil plantations in the Gulf region. So is Saudi Arabia involved in this? Uh, not Saudi. I don't believe Saudi Arabia okay. was, but um, the United Arab Emirates, okay. Kuwait, and um, Israel, Israel, and. Um, uh, maybe Saudi Arabia was involved. But Any Asian countries? No. Russia was not involved? No. Okay, just those no. that you know. Okay. It was, it, right. I, I remember it because I thought it was very strange okay. to have only um, Middle Eastern troops. That was really strange. Okay. And they were doing, um, they were fully armed with live ammunition and everything, doing exercises. So you were an eyewitness to the, these exercises? Y yes, on the UC campus, UC Berkeley right. campus. Let's yes. establish that. Lorraine saw yes. this with her own eyes. And that was completely bizarre. Well, they're having this every year. And Israel received um, the top award for military prowess from the Urban Shield organizers, it's, it's the Pentagon, mm -hmm. um, for their performance um, on the UC Berkeley campus. Mm -hmm. But isn't it bizarre to have a fully armed military exercise on a, on a university campus? From what you've told <laughs> me, no. It doesn't no. surprise me anymore, but it's, uh, it's untenable, and uh, my gosh, what have we become? Well, it means foreign troops are coming to our urban areas. Okay. Uh, they have talked uh, there's been talk from the military and military programs that people have been able to get documents, government documents, verifying that uh, they plan to do, uh, they plan food riots. Uh, when Janet Napolitano came to the University of California as president about three years ago, it was in October, um, she, the first thing she did was to send people out from Homeland Security to and FEMA to survey all of the food sources in the Bay Area. And they went in and they took over cash registers for a week so they got the whole money flow. They um, checked these food uh, stores, uh, little grocery stores, restaurants. They took them all over. They occupied them. And now they have the ability to completely lock up all food in America. Hmm. And uh, this is what is going to incite the food riots. Mm -hmm. And um, Now the purpose of that is what, for, for the civilian population, uh, to cry for martial law? Or yes, for, for, yes. For the government yes. or, or the, yes. the men in the powder blue helmets to yes. come and rescue us? Yes, yes. To bring us food? Yes, bring us food. So they're going to start, yes. this is a siege yes. warfare. It's, it's a siege warfare, exactly. That's exactly right. And it's to subdue the civilian population to, um, to be subservient and obedient to them. And they don't get fed. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. if they don't do what they're told to do. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so Urban Shield happened, and then two weeks later, um, the George Soros Foundation funded uh, a color revolution in the United States. This is after all the color revolutions they did in Central Asia and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And we know what happened to those countries. They were wrecked. Uh, so George Soros and the Open Society Foundation that he funds uh, sponsored the Occupy uh, movement which started on Wall Street in New York City and then it spread all over the world mm -hmm. including the Bay Area and Davis. Now what is very bizarre and no one has been able to answer my question why was that Occupy situation why did that happen on the Davis campus when Katehi was Chancellor? Because Davis was never an anti-war, they weren't interested in anti-war, they weren't interested in free speech in the 60s. They were, um, they were just so passive. I was a student here then. And um, I even went one day with a professor, he drove me down to Berkeley. He'd gone to Berkeley and I worked for him, Dr. Axelrod. And he said, let's go down and look, look at the campus. I know they're, they're uh, shooting tear gas and stuff at the students. So we went down, I think we were going to the library, and my God, there were people running all over the place. They were throwing bricks off of balconies. Uh, there was tear gas. The police were using it all over the campus to subdue the students. It was just so different from... What year was this about? Um, that was about 1968. 68, okay. Yeah, it mm -hmm. was at, towards the end of the Vietnam War. Right, the whole anti-war movement. Yeah, sure. it was mm -hmm. the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. And um, that was very, very bizarre. I just wanted to go back to quiet, peaceful Davis. And it's mm -hmm. still really quiet and peaceful. It's a very nice campus, very nice ambiance. Deceptively so. Yeah, deceptively so, until you find out what's really <laughs> going on. <laughs> So, um, so the Soros Occupy movement, uh, Laurence was uh, observing it in Oakland and San Francisco, and he realized that uh, there were things that were uh, very strange, um, like like um, goon troops dressed up like activists, and he and then he realized it was really dangerous. He got on a plane and left. He went to the East Coast. And that night uh, is when the first murder happened of um, uh, people involved in that Occupy movement oh, in Oakland. Mm -hmm. So it got violent after that, and it was infiltrated by law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was right. It was too dangerous sure. to be there. And that was part of the M.O. back right. in the 60s as well. Yes. So, so what happened is, of all places... Uh, Davis had an Occupy movement, but the students were very, very quiet, and they were very peaceful, and they were sitting on the ground with their with their hoodies on and and their heads down, and it was. This is November two thousand eleven. Yes, we're talking about around yes. Thanksgiving time. Yes, and. Um, uh, they they weren't rioting or anything, and um, I mean they were completely peaceful. They had a constitutional right to express their opposition to uh, whatever they wanted to, and uh, so I guess that um, now you see the chancellors don't do anything without an okay from the UC president's office, and um, or they're they're very carefully handed and inst handled and instructed and everything programmed. And so um, Linda Katehi um, sort of stayed inside the um, Barack Hall until two or three in the morning. And then um, it was in the middle of the night or very late at night. And she came out and the students were sitting on the ground. There wasn't a peep out of them holding candles. And she walked through that crowd She's very attractive, but that night she looked like a demon. And she walked through that crowd with these long strides and this very, very uh, horrible look on her face. And these are her students. 
doing what they're entitled to do legally. And she went through the crowd, and then she disappeared. And then, uh, I think it was the next day, the police, the, the campus police came in with cans of, uh, they called it pepper spray, but it was actually bear repellent. Hmm. And that's a play on the, 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 um, the bear represents the University of California, the oh, grizzly bear. The golden bear. bear. The golden bear, yes, right. Which is also on the state flag right. of the California Republic. That's right. Yes. It's a logo, it's a symbol of the state of California. And so they said it was pepper spray, but it wasn't. It was bear, bear repellent. Bear repellent. So okay. the Golden bear repellent. So the order came from the president's office. Which is? Who Janet is? Janet Napolitano. Okay, of this bloodline yes. we're talking about. Yes, okay. of, what, of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So um, that caused a global scandal. It was covered by all the media everywhere. Um Katehi was investigated, and, and she was blamed and everything, but, of course, the president's office protected her, and, um, uh, and she was not put on administrative leave. I don't know if there was an investigation done, maybe a wimpy one or a halfway one. But I think they had uh, William Bratton come in as, a, as an outside consultant, and, of course, he wrote a report that was going to minimize her responsibility. yeah. yeah. You know who he was. He was a former police chief of, oh, I think, Boston. and then he, Boston. Then he was in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And now he's just sort of a freelance pr police brutality yeah. Yeah, consultant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. William Bratton. He's their boy now. He's their boy. Yeah. And we should look in his, his uh, genealogy we as well. We should. And so, <laughs> and so what President, I mean, Chancellor Kotei actually did was she violated their constitutional rights mm -hmm. to free speech, to... Um, freedom of assembly. Freedom of assembly, um, and and in other ways as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was very very strange. I I never did understand that. Just but as a sidebar, I had dinner with a, a faculty person who will go unnamed, and he said that at a faculty meeting, he's with a very large department here at the U UC Davis campus. P.B. Katehi, or I'm just going to call her P.B. Katehi, not Linda, her, her, her cover name. P.B. Katehi came to the faculty meeting, and she gleefully, gloatingly announced that she was going to move on these students. She told them the revelation of the method, what she was going to do to it. So what I'm saying here is that there was malice aforethought involved. She had planned to do it. This is the spillover of Urban Shield that was the kickoff, mm -hmm. the oppression and suppression of now the universities. So was there a ritualistic uh, component to this? Absolutely. She needed to bloody her sword yes. to earn her bones, yes. to get the little teardrop yes. tattoo yes. under her eye? She had to kill the children. She had to kill yeah. the golden bear. Yes. Kill the Americans. Yes. Kill the dream. Kill the dream. Kill the, the, the freedom. Mm -hmm. Kill the hope. Mm -hmm killed the future. Wow. And so Katehi was the introduction of overtakeover of not only UC Davis, but of the University of California and of all universities in the U.S., the mm -hmm. land-grant universities, um, by the Jesuits and Monsanto. You see the Jesuits uh, created Monsanto. And Monsanto now is building buildings all over the, Ber the uh, Davis campus with their name on the buildings. And you see more and more uh, administrators who have that Jesuit look. They have a look. Um, this is an excellent book. The Secret History of the Jesuits. It's by Edmund Paris. This is what the Jesuits did to 68 countries in Europe, destroyed them in the, um, the 1800s. And then they came to the U.S. and they're doing the same thing now here. Mm -hmm. And uh, Could you describe the look? The look The physical is, look. The physical look is uh, wire rim glasses. It's all minimalization. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, real... Uh, stretched skin, sort of, uh, very clean shaven, um, 
and then just hair short and uh, slicked back. Um, it's just a real clean cut look. I noticed that a lot of the people who go to Bohemian Grove have that same look. Hmm. So those are the uh, financiers and economists and, and the people who drive the economy. They have that same look. Okay. Now, um, Obama, everyone in his administration, 10% um, uh, of Congress, they have all been Jesuit trained. Mm -hmm. Governor Brown, Panetta, Leon Panetta is a Californian. Um, Janet Napolitano, uh, they all went to Santa Clara University, a Jesuit institution. Um, Which, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is down around the San Jose area, right in the midst of the Silicon Valley. Around the same around, time. Around, yeah. 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 So, so geographically, it's positioned right, right, right in the center of, of uh, world technological innovation and surveillance. And yeah. in the United States, history... Uh, first of all, the Jesuits were terrified when the colonists made the U.S. Uh, uh, the um, Declaration of Independence and then the, the civil rights that we have and um, our Constitution. And uh, so they had three secret meetings in Italy in the early 1800s. One was the secret treaty of Verona, I believe it was 1815. And France, uh, Austria, Prussia, and Russia made a secret agreement to create a fund and to, uh, to fund it, uh, all of them together. And that, that money would be used to defeat all democratic movements on the co in their countries, on the continent, and in any future places, anywhere in the world, um, where a uh, uh, democratic movement might start, mm -hmm. even though there wasn't anybody there now except indigenous people who wouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that fund was um, received trillions of dollars uh, in World War II from the looting of 12 Southeast Asian countries and China of the accumulated wealth over 5,000 years of Silk Road trade. All of that money was looted and stolen, and it was... This was what they call Yamashita's gold. Yamashita's right? gold, With right. uh, Sterling Seagrave and right. Peggy Seagrave yes. wrote a great book right. on it, which That's should right. be required reading for That's everybody, right. because it brings all these different threads together, and it also shows how this, this uh, project, this centuries-long project, how it's been funded. Yes. Okay. And that's how it's funded. It's mm -hmm. by tr by stealing accre accumulated wealth. Now, who would know all that wealth was there other than those ancient Iranian tribes? They were the silk merchants that made that Silk Road really, really rich. And they were the richest of all. So um, that that money was all stolen. It was more gold than um, even the bankers in London knew existed on this planet. It was much more than the Nazi gold. And uh, that was taken to uh, Japan. The emperor hid, hid it under his, under his um, palace. And um, when that was full, then, then uh, they hid it other places. And then the U.S. embargoed Japan. So it was transported on Red Cross ships that were supposed to be full of wounded soldiers, and instead it was uh, full of gold and treasures, gemstones, everything. And it was placed in 67 hidden repositories that were built by Japanese engineers all over the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And they had very sophisticated tunneling very technology and yes. know-how, uh, which had trap doors and all types of yes. secret passages. Yes. Yeah. And that was all hidden in the Philippines, and um, when all of them had been completed and the very last one was full of treasure, one of the imperial princes was sent in a submarine to the Philippines. Prince Chichibu. Yes. And he went to that last repository to celebrate with all the engineers who were there. 
And um, at midnight, uh, he walked out. They were all drunk and singing and, and, and out of it. And um, he walked, uh, he took his driver, his little young uh, Filipino driver. They walked to the entrance. He blew up the entrance with mm -hmm. explosives and sealed them in where they died. And he had the, the map of all the repositories in his pocket. The driver took him to the beach. He gave him the keys, the, the driver to the, the keys to the little driver, and he said goodbye. The car's yours. And he got in the submarine and went back to Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, all of that treasure um, was discovered while well, Colonel Lonsdale, who was operating in uh, Japan during and after World War II. We're talking about Colonel Edward Lansdale. Edward Lansdale involved in the Kennedy assassination. And General MacArthur got together and they said, should we give all this treasure back to the countries it was stolen from, or should we keep it in secret accounts? And they decided to go and discuss it with President Truman. They decided to keep it in secret accounts all over the world, and that's been funding um, the overthrow, the very first overthrow of a democratically elected leader was Mossadegh of Iran. Mm -hmm. And it's been overthrows, a hundred years of overthrows, but um, the overthrows since World War II have been from funded by that that huge amount of money, trillions and trillions of dollars. And slightly more modestly, I from from my reading, from what my, I've uh, gathered, the election of Richard Nixon to the presidency was funded by this um, Yamashita's gold, this that's, treasure. That's right. And also the Liberal Democratic right. Party in Japan, which has ruled almost continuously since the end of World War II, mm. has been funded by this yes. black budget. Yes. Not and budget, but, but black bank. And Nixon gave Okinawa back to Japan without even... Uh, the Japanese didn't even ask him for it. They're going, what, what? we didn't even ask him for it. What's he doing that for? Well, he, he wanted election money so mm -hmm. that he would get elected, and they, sure. gave, they gave it to him. Mm -hmm. So you see all this under, underground stuff is happening. It's happening right here at Davis. Certainly. The same thing. It's the same agenda. It's the same ancient bloodlines, and it's the same secret money mm -hmm. that's funding it. So that's that's why this is so. Um, Just as a side very, very sidebar, important. I wrote a chapter in this book of mine, the current book mm -hmm. that I have about servitors of empire, which I devote an entire chapter to Iris Chang, ah. and she was being uh, heralded as, as this incredible researcher and historian, rightfully so. She was a very good researcher. She did the book on the, you know, as it's called, the Nanjing uh, massacre, mm -hmm. um, but then she befell these 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 groups she was on the Yamashita story a uh -huh. gold story mm -hmm. and I think what happened in her case is that she found out that the official history and propaganda that she had been fed in order to, to research this book mm -hmm. right on um, the Nanjing massacre which is a propaganda piece largely mm -hmm. this is what historians say not me this is what mm -hmm. they say and uh, this this particular chapter here talks about, and I think her, her mother is is in agreement with this. Her mm -hmm. so-called suicide was because she had found out that the Yamashita's gold was financing the very system that she thought she had been supporting, American yeah. democracy. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is all oh, yeah. very very re relevant for and, what's going on today. And I want to recommend this highly, Servitors of Empire. Studies in the Dark Side of Asian America, and this is by Daryl Hamamoto, and um, there is so little written uh, by Asians or non-Asians about uh, the Asian players in oh, all absolutely. of this. absolutely, and secret societies. And secret societies. And the role of the Jesuits in Asia, yes. including that's, Japan, that's Philippines, right. That's right. Vietnam. Yes, yes. That's where I'm taking and this. And they line. were, they came with the Portuguese explorers, and um, they were installed in Japan in the 1500s. Then they were kicked out. Then they were in kicked out in 1587, yes. Yes. which allowed Japan to flourish yes. and to develop to become a very powerful country right. that the Jesuits never forgave them that, for. That's right. And um, uh, so. Please read this. Please give it as a gift to people. Please recommend it 
because it's very, very informative and it's a huge missing piece of the history of our nation. And even more importantly, please support me in my battle with my Department of Asian American Studies, which yes. took me out of three courses this past winter quarter. That's right. Because they do not want the students to get this type of information. That's right. With the full backing of Linda Katehi, Dean uh, Susan Kaiser, and all the different Jesuits that are in these power positions that that are really running the show here at the University of California. I can buy. Yes, uh, this guy Carl. Um, I can buy. Is it I can buy? Yeah. Uh, I can. He uh, he fits. Yeah, he fits the the profile. Right? He's so the um the co chancellor. He's the co chancellor, and I announced this yes. at my faculty meeting this past week. And, um, of course, my, my colleagues scoffed at it and laughed at it. Oh, he's just uh, her handler and her press. I said, no, he's, vice, uh, he's the co-chancellor. Yeah. And then one of my colleagues yeah. is beginning to see that I'm not the crackpot that I, because yeah. they try to make Pinchy was being crazy and a crackpot. Yeah. She looked it up in her computer in real time as I was saying this, and she said, oh, my gosh, he's right. Yes. He is the co-chancellor. Yes. So late, the point here, late, it's not about me. It's just look behind the veil, look behind the curtain and see who's really in power and how the system functions. And there are more and more people, um, and I, I predict uh, there's going to be a renaissance in uh, academic and scholarly literature in general that's going to be fueled to a large extent by the innovative research of my colleague, my dear friend, Lorraine Moray. Yes. And that's what the enterprise is all about. Yes. That's what the human experience is about. Yes. This is how we've been able to survive and excel as a species, yes. and we are going to prevail in this yes. in, in this effort because we can break it down in ways that no ENIAC computer or AI program or logarithm even comes close to. So, um, so that is why Occupy happened here. That's why Katehi was chancellor. This is the new world order the ancient Iranian tribes making the rules and conditioning people and students and universities and the public and parents to expect this type of uh, illegal and unfair behavior because this is the future. And um, Dr. Uh, Hamamoto came up with a plan for a, an institution of cooperation between Vietnam and UC Davis. And um, it, the university was, uh, Davis, the campus, was really, really interested in this, in supporting it. And Dr. Q Lin um, helped uh, by taking delegations from uh, businessmen and so forth, different interested people, to Vietnam and back. And uh, so now the university is taking this over and um, trying to push Dr. Hamamoto out of the university by making things up and accusing him of things he didn't do and putting him on administrative leave. Well, the irony is that two months after uh, she was, he was put on administrative leave by Dr. Katehi, now she's on administrative <laughs> <laughs> leave. <laughs> so... Um, these are, um, these are just, uh, uh, now she's in a, uh, an, a, a UCD ethics scandal, and, uh, some of the things that she's been accused of are a controversial moonlighting activities, um, uh, DeVries University board seat, she took that and, uh, 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 John Wiley and Sons um, uh, board uh, position and took hundreds of thousands of, of dollars in money from them, which is illegal. It's a conflict of interest. Uh, she was involved in taking hundreds of thousands of dollars in university money and having the pepper spray, pepper spray scandal scrubbed off the internet. In other words, she paid a com computer personnel companies, private ones, to um, remove that whole scandal from the internet. Um, she, um, well, oh, the most recently, she has con contracted an external attorney. Yes. In Sacramento, spending I don't know how much money in order to go after me one more time since they yes. haven't really 
yes. been, been able to bury me completely. And the University of California. The university is paying for that. The taxpayers yes. of the state of California are paying for the outside persecution of me. And the University of California has buildings full of lawyers that, that are on salary, on, uh, that are UC employees. They use those for the first lawsuit. They don't hire outside law firms until the appeal. If they lose, they will appeal it. And they spent over $5 million on outside lawyers uh, on an appeal for an award of $350,000 to um, to a Mexican American man at UC Santa Barbara, so they're spending taxpayers' money, student money, five million dollars to reverse a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so bizarre. Uh, she also um, uh, the uh, strategic communications budget soared. Also, she also um, uh, increased the salary by $50,000 of her daughter-in-law after her son married this uh, um, woman on the UC staff at Davis. And uh, then she gave the woman a bunch of promotions and also took her son out of his graduate uh, school department and put it in his wife's department and put him under the supervision of his own wife. Mm -hmm. So there's, and then she lied to the president's office about the board money and everything. So, um, structural corruption from top yes. to bottom, from the departmental level, as in my case, all the way to the administration, to the president's see, office, to the president's office, yes. at the expense of the American yes. public. Yes, and the board of regents. And the they're, board of regents. They're involved too. Now, Lauren, as we wrap it up here, I wonder if you could uh, perhaps give us a, a vision of how yes. we're going to prevail over these individuals, these, these, this cast of characters, which so far have gone undetected and as, and as a result um, unpunished. First of all, this is a, a, an extreme example of political ponerology, and that is the evil inherent and expressed and through uh, politicians, and and these are these are public figures. Pol they're a form of politicians mm -hmm. in the education arena. So how will we prevail over well, this pomerology system? They get away with it because uh, the public doesn't know. The students don't know. It's all done secretly. So and, we'll prevail and, by yes. educating them. Yes, by educating people, by exposing the scandals, to by presenting the truth and it empowers people by putting that truth out and just leaving it alone. Uh, you don't want to force people to do anything. You want to say, here's the information when you're ready to, uh, to use it. Mm -hmm. And um, it empowers people to find their own solutions that a lot of times are better than what you would have thought up sure. for them. And um, I think that the students on the campus understanding the corruption of Chancellor Katehi were responsible for this scandal now coming out in public and for the removal of her. Well, she's only That's on great. she's only on administrative uh, leave for a month on mm -hmm. a paid salary, mm -hmm. but I think that um uh, people who are in the uh, California government are not happy about it either. Right. And there are many calls. Uh, I believe that Jenna Napolitano, it was reported in the media several times, um, has um, asked for her to resign. I see. And so... She has retained a lawyer, so she, yes. might, she might not go without a fight. Uh, she'll probably not go without a fight, but mm -hmm. when... She was in a scandal when she left the University of Illinois. Sure. So, mm -hmm. uh, the and so was her, his uh, her replacement, yes. who, who's the acting yes. chancellor. So we're talking about a system, ladies and yes. gentlemen. We're talking about individuals here, but we're talking about a system which is in badly, in bad need, serious need of investigation, reformation, and the perspective that Ms. Moray has provided us today yes. has been an incredible tool. Yes. And prying up these barnacles that are slowing down the ship. Yes. Because we're going to sail to 
to the to the outer universe if allowed to do yes. so. That's our part of our, our endowment. Science yes. is not inherent. It's it's liberating. But yes. we have these types of people who have monopolized this knowledge right. and have perverted it. Right. So we're going to free it up. And we're going to enter into a new era, a renaissance of human creativity and achievement. Absolutely. If these people are just shunted aside. And, and we'll do a piece in reconciliation to say, just go away. All yes. right. Just let us do our thing. Right. We're not interested in throwing you in prison where you should be. <laughs> just let us be. Let us fulfill our destinies as human beings. And what's so egregious is this is this is an outrageous, outrageous uh, violation of university policy, of state government policy, of constitutional rights. I it's mean, criminal. It's criminal. Let's call it what it is. It and, is criminal. And yet, this selective enforcement, putting her in administrative leave for only one month, is typical of the University of California, and there's so many people who've done even worse things in the administration who never uh, were, were made accountable for it because it's part of the culture. Now, what is happening in the University of California in UC Davis is this, that, this swing to Satanism is converting these institutions into places where they're bringing foreign students here, they're bringing out-of-state students here, and they're training them to occupy their own countries, to overthrow their own governments, and to act as saboteurs in corporations and places where they go for employment in the future. And so it's destroying their, the fabric, the social fabric and the economic fabric of their countries. We have been warned, ladies and gentlemen, it's up to us to subvert these plans. That's right. And they've been workshopped and they've been wargamed. They've been white papered. We know the problem now. Now is the time to act. So can we, at this point, promise to carry on the conversation and yes. further deepen it yes. at, a, at a later time? Yes. Ms. Murray, Lauren Murray, my dear friend and colleague, thank you so much for this conversation. It has been a joy, a pleasure. I haven't had this this much fun so far as intellectual <laughs> exchange in years. Because I'm used to working with cowards, bullies, and ignoramuses. Well, I'm not afraid, and I love adventures, and uh, this is really the best adventure I've ever been on. With the wildest characters involved, and who would ever think Fidel Castro was an ancient Iranian who is, his family and his bloodline have ruled the world for the last 5,000 years. Who would believe that? That's we're, how deceptive they are. We're going to put humanity back on top. Yes. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Yes.